Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining up to this uh, web session about uh, ZHEAP. Uh, my name is uh, Hans-Jürgen Schönig. I'm the CEO of uh, CyberTech. And uh, for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to guide you through a very exciting new technology, which has uh, <coughs> basically starting to take shape some uh, time ago. So I hope you enjoyed the session and uh, glad that everybody's here. So brief introduction uh, about myself. Uh, who am I and who is my, uh, who is my company? Uh, just as a brief uh, introduction, I'm uh, the CEO of Cybertech and I'm a senior database consult uh, consultant with more than 20 years of uh, Postgres experience. Uh, we've been doing Postgres since uh, 1999 and I've written various books on the, on the subject. So uh, I hope you enjoy the session. So basically who we are, we are uh, a Postgres support company. So we provide 24-7 uh, uh, support for Postgres. We do training, consultancy, uh, performance tuning, uh, clustering, etc. So basically, uh, we, we do everything you, can, you, can, uh, you will need for Postgres. And recently, we've also expanded more into you know, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, all those uh, brand new technologies, uh, etc. We are worldwide, so our headquarters are here in, uh, in Austria, but we also got offices in Uruguay, uh, South Africa, Mauritius, Estonia, Poland, and Switzerland. So we're a very international uh, company and we're serving uh, customers worldwide. You might know some of them, uh, such as uh, United Nations, IBM, Porsche, BMW. So basically we got a, a, a nice set of brand names we've been working for and which we are still working for at the moment. So after this quick introduction, uh, let's get started um, with the agenda. So the first thing we got to understand uh, is how a standard Postgres table works. Then we have to wrap our heads around uh, the notion of a table bloat and vacuum. And that's naturally going to lead us into ZHEAP, which is um, going to solve uh, some of the issues uh, we're facing with normal tables. So we're talking about, you know, the basic architecture, the design goals of ZHEAP, and then I'm going to guide you through some internals, uh, such as, you know, transaction slots and TPD, etc. And uh, finally, performance implications, space implications, as well as uh, a little outlook uh, regarding um, how things are going to work in the future. So I hope you enjoy the session and let's get started. So traditional tables, uh, as we're talking about the relational uh, database, a, a table is quite an important thing. So we have to understand uh, how it works internally and what it means for uh, some of the workloads. So the most important thing is that in Postgres, everything uh, is stored in eight kilobyte blocks. Of course, you can change the block size uh, for, for various reasons, but in general, the basic notion is that everything is stored in an 8K block, right? So if you've got a table, it's basically a compilation of, of 8K blocks um, written on disk, right? <coughs> so if we look into the layout uh, of a standard, uh, a kilobyte block as we used to uh, do that in, um, in, in Postgres for, for uh, 30 years, basically. What we see here is um, the first thing you got here is a page header, which is uh, 20 something bytes for, for a standard uh, page. And then uh, if we insert uh, data, what we do is we basically add rows to the end and on top, you see those uh, lean piece or line pointers or whatever you might call it. It's a 16-bit offset that points to the row. So if you, if you look at this uh, lean P number one, it contains a number which points directly to the beginning of this tuple number one. Tuple is a row, right? And the second, uh, the second uh, thing here is uh, basically... Um, the second lean P is going to point uh, to the beginning of, uh, of the second tuple, right? So we're adding lean P's from the beginning, we're adding tuples uh, from the end, and if they meet in the middle, so P the upper, P the lower, um, then basically the, the page is considered to be full, right? And then we're going to write the new one. So 
tuples coming from the end, lean piece coming from the beginning. That's the standard layout of a page in Postgres for a standard heap, right? So the point here is that in order to understand set heap and also this whole notion of transactions, table bloat, etc., we have to understand um, the concept of visibility and transactions. So I got a very simple example here. So it, on the left-hand side, we're going to start uh, a transaction and we're going to update a number. We set the number from uh, one to four. And what's going to happen is that Postgres is going to to find this uh, value number one, it's going to lock the row, right? The, the first important thing is it's going to lock the row because if, if an update happens concurrently, we have to make sure that two people cannot update the same row at the same time. So if we look at the right-hand side, we start the transaction, we do the update, the row is locked. So Postgres is going to reread the row um, as soon as the left-hand uh, transaction commits, the row is gone, so no update is going to happen on the right-hand side. So a table is not only there basically to store uh, the data itself, it's also highly important to have a storage format which is capable of handling updates, which is capable of handling transactional visibility, etc. And uh, this is going to bring us exactly to the core of the set heap idea. Okay. So keep in mind that there is this update going on. So what's the problem uh, with standard heaps, right? So the standard problem is, uh, let me show you some, some numbers. So the, the main issue basically with a standard uh, Postgres table is, is, uh, is a problem uh, related to, uh, to something we call table bloat. So table bloat means that the table is going to grow ways out of proportion. So you got a million rows, but you need five terabytes of data to store it, right? So that's, that's the classical concept. Uh, that's a classical problem, which is basically known as table bloat. So let's take a look. I've created a table with uh, just one integer column. And uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, simplicity, I turned all the vacuum off that's not something you should do in production, but I'm just showing you uh, what's going to happen on the storage side, and I don't want anything to interfere with, with my sample. So this is why I turned auto vacuum off uh, for the sake of this example. Then I'm inserting uh, a million rows here, and then I'm going to measure uh, the size of the table. And in my case, it's going to be 35 megabytes. So no problem. That's, that's fine. But Let's run an update. Update in Postgres has to duplicate the rows. So basically, if you've got a million rows, if you update them, what you end up with is basically 2 million rows. And the reason is concurrency. You still have to be able to roll back the transaction. So if the update fails after uh, 900,000 rows, you still want to abort the operation. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that while you're running the update, there might still be a second guy reading the table who wants to see the old version of the row. So what happens here is that Postgres has to duplicate the row. So instead of 35 megabytes, what we end up with is basically 70 megabytes or 69 megabytes, which is simply related to the rounding, etc. But basically what happened is that the size of our table has doubled because we did the update. Okay, so it's super important. Update is going to duplicate the row. And this is mandatory if your database is supposed to support transactions, which Postgres naturally does. Okay. So uh, let's run vacuum. You know, the holy grail of everything is vacuum. What it does is it says 100,000 rows removable, uh, 1 million rows removable. 1 million rows non-removable, but at the end of the day, the size of the table is the same. So now we got a million active rows and space worth a million rows, which can be reallocated in the future, but it's still used on disk. That's the important issue. 
And the problem is that if you're running many updates and if vacuum is maybe not able to reclaim the space efficient enough, or if they're long running transactions or whatever there might be, the problem is that your table is usually not gonna shrink on disk. So the size on disk, once, once you're there, you screw, right? So once you have basically um, created table bloat, it's very hard to get rid of it. So let's take a look in more detail. Uh, vacuum is able to, uh, to reallocate the dead rows, but it's not going to shrink stuff on disk, right? Um, and the next important uh, thing is that um, a row can only be removed if nobody can see it anymore. So long transactions are certainly going to be your enemy. So let's take a look at, uh, at this, uh, at this uh, example here. We see a, uh, a connection, so a transaction basically, and the left-hand side is performing a long read. And the important thing here is that a read in Postgres is, is, is like a, a frozen snapshot. So once you start reading, what happens is that, that basically your select statement is, is working like on a frozen set of data. So regardless of, of what's going to change uh, concurrently, your, your, your visibility of the data is, is frozen, right? So on the right-hand side, if we run a delete, and if we commit this delete, the left select is still going to see the deleted data. That has a couple of implications because delete is not allowed to, to really physically kill the row because we might still roll back. And commit is also not able uh, to delete the row physically because the second transaction is still going to see it, right? So what it means is that the first vacuum we're running here is not allowed to kill anything. So some people complain that they keep running vacuum, vacuum, vacuum all over again, but nothing changes. And that's exactly the reason why that is the case. So only the second vacuum in my case would have any um, effect on the database by being able uh, to, to clean out rows, right? So your main enemy um, when it comes to table bloat is, uh, is certainly uh, long-running transactions, frequent updates, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So there are many upsides to to the Postgres heap. I mean, it's it, it's a wonderful thing, but the, but there is no such thing as a perfect storage engine. There's only a storage engine that fits a certain purpose, and the standard Postgres uh, storage engine uh, fits many purposes. But it's certainly not something that uh, fits every purpose. And, and this classical frequent update, table bloat stuff, that's something Postgres doesn't like. We, we, we can do it very well on the locking side, but on the table uh, space allocation side, there, there are some issues which, uh, which need to be fixed. So PG squeeze is a way out because you can always run vacuum full to shrink your uh, to shrink your, um, your table, but it needs a table lock, a very extensive, long table lock. So one way to get around this is, of course, to use PG squeeze, which can basically shrink a table uh, in place um, and, uh, and reduce this, this table lock uh, as much as possible, right? It can do a lot more like, you know, moving table spaces and index organizations, but, uh, but basically you shouldn't get there in the first place that an operation as, uh, such as vacuum full is, is needed in the first place, okay? So, that tip, coming to the rescue. Uh, basically, the idea of, of having uh, more storage engine in Postgres is not new. Um, if you look at the uh, traditional source code, you already see, you know, the, the idea of having pluggable storage very early on in the project. Uh, but SETIP itself is, uh, is something that's still under development and hopefully uh, it can be moved uh, towards a production ready state. And we're certainly putting some effort into that uh, to make it happen, okay? So SETIP design goals. First of all, perform updates in place. So Postgres, the standard Postgres table has to copy a row on update, okay? So the question is, where do you put the copy, right? So that's the main question. Second thing is have smaller tables. Usually 
things that are smaller are performing better, right? So we want smaller tables, which is especially important um, when we're talking about the tuple header, which, which I'm going to do shortly. Then there is a huge issue around alignment. Uh, next, we want to make sure that we reduce writes as much as possible. So avoid touching pages if they're not modified, which can happen in Postgres, by the way. So a read is, can actually modify a table. Um, and we want to reuse uh, space more quickly. And finally, for set heap, we want to get rid of vacuum. So that's a major, major issue. We just want to get rid of vacuum uh, in order to, uh, to, to just have a more efficient way of, of space um, uh, re, re, reconsumption, reuse. So tuple headers, that's a major, major, major thing. So on the left-hand side, um, that's the tuple header of set heap. On the right-hand side, what you see is the tuple header of Postgres, of a standard heap table. And what you would see here is a major, major difference. So on the right-hand side, uh, the Postgres tuple header is 20 plus bytes. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot more information in a standard tuple header in, uh, in Postgres, right? So um, set heap is way more efficient. So if we look at the numbers, a standard um, row in Postgres has, has a lot more than 20 row, uh, bytes of overhead, right? And secondly, um, the set heap thing is only five bytes, okay? So obviously we're already saving uh, something in the order of 20 bytes for, uh, for the header uh, in, uh, for each row. That's a lot. I mean, if, you, if, if we're talking about, let's say, a billion rows, we're talking about 20 gigabytes already only for the header. Okay, that's massive. Secondly, and we don't see this uh, in, on this slide, but it's also important, um, is uh, CPU alignment. So if, if you are looking at the standard heap in Postgres for efficiency reason, it used to be that way, uh, what you do is you, uh, let's say an integer field is only allowed to start um, at, the, at the multiplier of word length, right? So you wouldn't start on disk an integer field after three bytes, right? So you would start after four bytes because, because of CPU alignment, right? And that can add up. I, I've written a blog post on this uh, alignment stuff some time ago, and it can really, I mean, if you, if you organize your columns properly and column order and things like that in, in a standard, um, in a standard uh, table, you can save, let's say, 25% in, in some cases uh, in a standard Postgres table just by reshuffling the columns in a clever way. So CPU alignment is expensive. It, it, it can cost you dearly in terms of storage consumption. So uh, set is also trying to, to attack this thing. So how can you do that? And the answer is in a standard table in Postgres, the transactional visibility is, is attached to the row. And what set does, it moves this transactional visibility basically to the block level. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're updating a billion rows, I mean, it's not like it's, it's one billion rows randomly spread. It's, if you update a billion rows, I mean, it, many of them are going to be in the same page anyway, right? Um, so by moving this visibility information to the block level, it's going to be uh, a lot more efficient. So what you see here is, is the concept of a transaction slot. So if you update a tuple, you're not going to place a magic on the tuple header. But what happens is that basically you allocate a, a transaction slot, right? And then 10 rows can uh, are may, are maybe updated within the same transaction, right? So it's going to be a bit more efficient because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically like some normalized way of handling visibility. If you look closely, you will also see a little detail here is that in, uh, in the heap, you edit tuples from the back, but you edit item pointers from the front. And what you see here is that tuples are actually in the same order 
as the item pointers at the beginning. That's also done for, for efficiency reasons. So that's not a mistake in my drawing. That's actually um, an intentional thing um, that item pointers and tuples are going to be in the same order. What you also see is that we have uh, four uh, transaction slots here, which is the default. So uh, that's the standard uh, layout of a new uh, set heap uh, page. And as I said, the tuple itself is already going to be uh, a lot smaller. So what you see there as, uh, as a transaction slot is really just a small thing. So it's not as big as it, as it shows up in the, in the graphics. Here. So what's in the transaction slot? It contains a little bit of uh, information, like uh, what's the transaction ID, then there is the epoch. And then there's the latest undo record pointer of this transaction. So you have to know basically how to, how to fix stuff in, in case of a rollback. So what you saw here is, which I pointed out before, is that we are talking about uh, four uh, transaction slots per page. But what happens if you got six transactions touching this page? And the answer is, um, there are so-called TPT pages, which are basically overflow transaction slot uh, pages. So that if you really have more than just a small number of transactions uh, focusing on the same uh, page, there is a mechanism that you can have more transaction logs, uh, transaction slots. Sorry, uh, than you you really um, have in your in your page already. Right. So some of them are in the page for efficiency reasons. But if you really need more, there is a way to do that. So let's come to the most important uh, thing here. How do you handle this whole stale data, undo, rollback, update, etc.? So how does SETI do that? And the answer is uh, the invention of undo. OK, so what is undo? Let's take a look. Let's go through some uh, basic operations and let's see what it means on these. So let's suppose we're doing an insert. And what's happening here is that if we insert a row, what we do is first we have to allocate the transaction slot. Remember, transaction slot is about visibility, right? And then we somehow have to make sure that in case of a rollback or in case of a failure or in case of whatever, so rollback basically, um, we have to restore the old situation in the table already. And the way we do that is we emit a, an undo record, right? So we, we do the insert, we, we emit an undo record so that in case of a rollback, we have to know what we have to fix, right? So in order to get back to the original state. Normally, in a normal, in a normal uh, Postgres table in a heap, when an error happens, Basically, Postgres just switches off the transaction. So the stale data is still there. It's just not visible anymore. So if you, if you, do, you start a transaction, you insert a billion rows, you roll back, the rollback is instant, right? Because Postgres has simply turned off this transaction, so it's not visible anymore. In case of set heap, we're going we're gonna to repair, right? So you're inserting uh, five rows, you roll back, we're going to repair uh, this thing. Um, after rollback, right? So we really want to get rid of those dead rows as soon as we can. So space can be reclaimed instantly after rollback. So that's super important, right? Let's talk about update. Um, it's a bit more complicated because we, we got to look at two situations here, really. The first one is we update row. So we're updating 67 to 69, let's say. So in this case, the new row is going to fit into the same piece of storage in the table, right? That's a bit easier. Secondly, if we update, say, from, um, from a short uh, name to a long name, right? so obviously the row is going to grow. In this case, uh, the new row might not fit into the old space. So we have to handle this differently in order to facilitate this update. Okay? So let's take a look at both cases. If the row is shorter, we can overwrite it. So what's going to happen is Postgres is going to overwrite the row in the set heap. It's going to emit an undo record so that in case of, uh, of an error, we can just 
put back the old row as it's done the other systems and that's it. In short, we hold the, we hold the copy of the, uh, we hold the new row in set heap and the copy of the old row in the undo so that we can copy it back in case it's needed. Okay, so that's, that's the idea. Have the undo, fix it in case it's needed. Okay. So what happens if the row does not fit? In this case, performance is going to be worse because it's going to be delete insert essentially, right? So you have to delete the old row, put put in a new row uh, in the in a uh, in a different uh, in a different place, and that's of course going to be less efficient because obviously you're going to jump around a bit more, so it's not going to be as efficient, right? So in other words, it's going to be um, it's going to be uh, faster if you're updating uh, basically either to a shorter value or to an identical value, right? So question is, when can we reclaim uh, space instantly, right? Because it, remember, we're fighting table bloat. And fighting table bloat means reallocating space as quickly as we can, okay? So when we update to a shorter version or... Uh, when a non-in-place update is performed. So basically, uh, when it has to go out, okay? Delete, same thing. Uh, we emit an undo record so that you can put back the row and uh, then we, we just remove the row from set heap, right? That's it. So delete is, is fairly simple. There, there are basically no uh, complications I'm aware of here. I mean, this whole thing is super complicated, but just... Uh, for the sake of, uh, of the explanation. So let's take a look at the undo, okay? So as I mentioned before, the undo is really there uh, to, to store this, uh, this uh, transactional information to put it back, right? So how it works is obviously there are, there are pages here and there's a header and then come the undo records uh, one by one. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the header uh, basically contains some some details, etc. But it also contains uh, the tuple data, right? So basically, we're putting the row uh, into the undo in order uh, to fix it. So it, it's written in a sequential way. So it's gonna be it's gonna be nice and shiny. Okay. Let's talk about rollback. I mean, if we commit, that that's more of the easy part. Uh, rollback is more of the fun part here. Um, let's take a look at, at, at rollback and, and see this, this whole uh, idea, okay? Rollback. In case a rollback happens, our undo has to make sure, as I pointed out before, that the old state is restored. So what, what means is it has to copy them back. And that's a major, major distinction between heap and set heap. Because in a heap table, rollback is instant because it's basically just two bits right so we're setting the transactional information we're setting two bits that's it okay in case of set heap th that's not so simple anymore because we have to copy it back and, and and what happens if we crash and blah 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 so it, it, it's gonna it's gonna be more complicated right the next obvious question we have to ask is okay so we're putting all those rows to the undo Obviously, this, this thing is growing. So how can we get rid of the undo? Because in, in heap, the question is, how can we clean a row from our table? And now the main question is, how can we basically remove the undo information? Because no matter how we, how we see that, at, at the end of the day, we still gonna have to remove stale data, right? So and for the undo, there are three cases. So if no transaction, can see the data anymore, we can remove it, right? And uh, secondly, we can also remove it if the undo has been completed. So we can remove the undo if nobody can see it anymore. Obviously, nobody can read this data, so we don't have to protect it. And secondly, we can remove it if the undo has been completed, so we, if we fix the old row. And for committed transaction, till the time they are all visible. So we, okay, so how is this gonna happen? Undo workers. 
I mean, everything I'm telling you here is what we got at the moment, right? So there are still some discussions going on, some design issues, how this is supposed to be, etc. Uh, there might be changes to this to this whole um, thing still, in some cases. So what I'm telling you here is what we got as of December 2020, right? Discarding undo logs is performed by a worker. So the idea is to have a process for every database, which is going to do that, right? So uh, the idea is to have these this, this undo workers for every database to, to clean up the database. So that's, that's the basic idea to make sure that it, it's, it, it's not affecting the transaction itself too much. So what does it look like uh, on the graphical level? So what you see here is basically that those old segments are, are, are basically removed and we got active segments, which, which are currently in use for, uh, for new transactions. But that, that's more of an internal thing. I don't want to focus on that uh, too much at this point. Okay, but this is the basic layout of this, of this undo processes. Let's take a look at some practical observation. So um, I've compiled uh, a nice version uh, of, uh, of SetHeap on my machine and I've run some tests uh, to show you what it looks like and what it feels like. I mean, this is by no means comprehensive, but I want to show you some of the, um, of the key things you, you might want to know in this, in this area, okay? So first of all, I've created some random data. So what you see here is I've created a, a very nice uh, temporary uh, table with uh, 10, million, um, 10 million rows each. Um, and it just generated some, some text and some random number and an ID. So just 10 million rows containing something, right? No, no meaning, but just quick creation. So what I'm doing here is, first of all, I'm creating a table, create table age one, like our temporary table. So it has the same fields and it's using heap, okay? So I'm copying um, data from my temporary table uh, to a standard Postgres table. And what you see here is it's gonna be uh, 7.5 seconds. It's gonna copy those uh, 10 million rows and that's it. Okay, very simple. Try to do the same thing with set heap. So I'm creating a set one table it's again like the temporary table, which is our in-memory reference thing here is, and we're using set heap and we're copying it over. And I want to point out here is that, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, of this talk, there is no such thing as a storage engine that, that fixes everything. There's no such thing as a perfect storage engine. It doesn't exist, right? So what you see here obviously is that this, this whole, um, insert process took longer than for a normal table. But again, the strength of set heap is to avoid the table bloat, to fix updates, etc. So it's a slightly different uh, focus than uh, the standard heap table. So I was complaining a lot about the standard heap table, but in this case, I'm saying it's, 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 it's not only darkness, there's also light, you know, so we have to see this really from, uh, from various perspectives here. But as you can see, because of alignment and because of the smaller tuple header, obviously the size of the set heap table is only half of what we got in the, uh, in the, uh, in the normal uh, scenario, right? So we're comparing 498 megabytes to 251 megabytes for a real production table with more than three columns the difference might be smaller, you know? So in this case, it's half of it, but remember it's three columns only, which means that the, the heap tuple header is, is gonna be way more relevant than in case you've got 60 columns, right? So, but I'm just gonna point out that the, 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 the difference in size might be major. So it might be major, major difference here, okay? And in this case, it's close to 50%. So this, this does make a huge difference. So let's, Start a transaction on the set heap, set one. 
250 megabytes of table size, and then we're going to write an update. So update set one, set ID is ID plus one. So remember, my first example was before that the size of the table is going to duplicate, right, on a standard heap. In this case, what we see is that the size of the set heap is still going to be 251 megabytes. So the question is, where is the data? And that's the answer. So what you see here is in this uh, base directory, usually in the base directory, there is a uh, subdirectory for each database. So in this case, we've got a subdirectory called undo. And what you, saw, what you see here is basically a list of one megabyte files, which are the, the size, uh, which are the undo uh, files, which basically hold the copy of this, um, of this hopefully stale data, okay? So that's what it looks like under the hood um, if, you, if you're doing this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this set heap update, okay? So uh, that was a brief introduction from uh, my side as far as the uh, state of affairs is, is concerned. I mean, keep in mind that this is not a comprehensive uh, thing, but just a 45 minutes uh, explanation of the basic concept. I mean, one could go on for hours uh, about this stuff because it's, it's massive, it's, it's a massive undertaking. So let's take a look at the roadmap, right? First of all, um, we've been uh, in contact with some of the, uh, of uh, some folks from the Postgres community to finally agree uh, on, a, uh, on the final design issues. So what you've seen here is uh, basically the code uh, we got and the code we inherited uh, from uh, the previous development uh, team, right? And uh, so, so still we are we're in touch with, with, with some of, of the folks to, uh, to basically make sure that design patterns are fixed, uh, that some bugs are removed. And we have to keep in mind that this is a major, major code base. And this is massive code base. Um, it's not just the five liner or so. It's, we're talking about tens of thousands of lines of code here. And it's not that easy to handle because you have to keep in mind that this, the storage engine itself has to support everything that heap does. So we're talking about locking, we're talking cleanup, truncation, concurrency, blah, blah, blah. It's massive, right? So what happens here is that we are trying to, to produce something uh, which can which can move closer to core, and uh, the first thing there is certainly the the undo thing, which is the core infrastructure we need uh, in order to to make set heap work. And that can be quite invasive because it, it's touching many areas like a transaction log, etc. So it, it's not like a, a full plugin. It, it needs a lot of core uh, stuff uh, to work, right? And hopefully it's going to go there someday. So. If you happen to be bored, if you happen to be a skilled developer, just please get in touch and let's move this forward because table bloat is a major issue and it certainly needs uh, some fixing. By the way, the same is true for, for column stores. So if you're interested in, in working on column stores for Postgres, which is super important feature, please, please step forward. I mean, we, we need you, certainly. So, Finally, uh, usually this is supposed to be an interactive uh, discussion, uh, but this was pre-recorded. So if you got any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to send me an email. Um, also feel free uh, to call me or to send me a message on, uh, on Twitter. So any feedback is welcome. And uh, I certainly want to say thank you for your attention. I hope this was an interesting topic and I hope to see you again very soon hopefully in real life after COVID is over. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Get in touch with us and uh, visit our website. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. So thank you and uh, enjoy the event.